are back on the Zero Hour. I'm your host, Richard R.J. Escal. Imran Khan is a former world celebrity. He is the former prime minister of Pakistan, still a very much leading figure there and uh, in the world community. He has just joined us from giving an address to his nation of Pakistan, uh, and we wanted to speak to him about that and uh, a number of other issues uh, involving his country, his plans, and the world situation overall. So without any further ado, Imran Khan, welcome to the program. Thank you, Richard. My pleasure. Uh, we are very glad to have you. Uh, so you have just finished addressing your nation, sir, and uh, thank you for joining us immediately after that. Uh, what did you speak to the nation about exactly? Well, Richard, you know, my country is going through a terrible time right now. We have uh, really been taken over uh, by a bunch of uh, certified crooks. 61% of our cabinet is on bail, on corruption cases. And what they are doing is that uh, they, are, they have basically violated all fundamental rights of our citizens. And my party members have been through a, a terrible time. We have false cases registered against us. Senior members have been tortured, custodial torture. Uh, there have been uh, uh, a spate of uh, uh, cases where our people have been picked up and uh, they've disappeared and they've been brought back, uh, uh, traumatized. And uh, this total violation of our human rights. So we decided that we would start a campaign about filling up the jails in Pakistan. So our campaign is that we are going to flood the jails of this country in protest at what they are doing, not just violating our fundamental rights, but they're also violating the constitution. My party was uh, holding two, uh, two pro out of the four provinces, my party was uh, in uh, governing two of the provinces. And so we dissolved our two governments and the constitution is very clear that in 90 days from the time you dissolve your governments, they have to be general, they have to be elections. But unfortunately, because uh, the, these bunch of crooks are petrified of elections, because since my party has been out of power uh, in April uh, 22, out of the 36 by elections, we have swept 29 of them despite all the government machinery against us. So they are scared of the popularity of the party and they are running away from the elections. But in doing that, they are violating the constitution. Because after 90 days, uh, it means that the constitution has, has been um, abrogated. Mm -hmm. And so the, the campaign has two uh, points, this uh, filling up the jails. One is uh, the violation of fundamental rights including the violation of the constitution. And secondly, we are facing the worst ever inflation in our history. And people, the salaried class is being crushed. So really it is uh, these two reasons why we are We've just uh, we are in the we started our campaign today. Well, that's a that's a major announcement, and of course, uh, campaigns like this have have a uh, long and distinguished history in your part of the world before the creation of Pakistan. Mr. Gandhi and Mr. Jinnah were involved in such things, weren't they? They these were uh, correct me if I'm wrong on my history, but these uh, this principle which Martin Luther King later adopted in the Southern United States was civil disobedience to uh to take nonviolent action against the system that's what comes to mind for me was that what you were thinking in formulating this strategy absolutely richard the idea is to have a nonviolent campaign uh you know where it's a peaceful protest so that therefore you don't cause any damage to your society it's also you know a way of avoiding violence from our state you know uh, what they we we did peaceful protests uh, before one was on the 25th of May 22, and the violence our people faced in that protest, uh, thousands were put into jail. Uh, there were police jumping into people's houses in the middle of the night and uh, 
uh, picking up people and taking them to jails and then they suffered uh, torture. Two of our people got killed. So therefore, we decided that rather than uh, have a, a violent campaign, which would actually be a disaster for Pakistan, because our economy right now is in an extremely precarious position. So therefore, we, went, we decided this nonviolent option. So, uh, and let me ask you, since you mentioned the, the persecution that, or, and difficulties that some members of your party have gone through, uh, just for anyone who might be listening to this here in the States, who might not know, you were, uh, you were prime minister, you, uh, you were removed from office as a result of some, I, I don't know what you call them, machinations or arrangements or what have you, uh, certain members leaving your party and so on, uh, and we could talk about that a bit, but following your um, uh, you were leaving office you were uh, injured in an assassination attempt uh, later that year I believe October is that correct and um, you know there's an interesting uh, question I have for you about that sir because uh, I want first of all the, the articles that I've read from the Pakistani press uh, they say that you know, in the U.S., when we talk about the assassinations of famous people in the 1960s, there's a lone gunman theory comes up, right? That it was one person acting. And it seems to me almost as if the stories have suggested that it was one disgruntled individual who managed to somehow get his hands on a rather expensive handgun. Uh, but I watched the videos of the shootings, sir, and it, it seems to me that it looked like automatic weapon fire to me. It did not look to me like handgun gun fire which raises a number of questions first question is uh how are you now are you uh, are you well are you recovering are you um i know people would be want to know that well richard first of all uh, my government was removed through a, a conspiracy i mean it wasn't removed through uh what you would say a normal democratic process where suddenly your members lose confidence in your government because my government at the time I was removed, we had the best economic performance of a government in the last 17 years. And that's despite two years of uh, COVID-19. And we were the top three countries that dealt with the, with the COVID crisis. I mean, Pakistan was uh, given as an example, which handled it the best. So uh, our economy was performing better than it was in 17 years. We had, you know, record performances of exports, our tax collection, our growth rate was 6%. So at that time, the government was removed, not because my members, some members, backbenchers were, were disgruntled. It was because they were paid over a million dollars per uh, member of parliament. They were bought. And a whole lot of people were involved, the opposition, the government, the people who are in government right now. You know, remember these, uh, I just need to, you know, people who don't understand. These, the people who are involved, I repeat, 61% of them are on bail or corruption cases. They are the ones who now use this uh, dirty money to buy our members. But not just them, our ex-army chief was completely involved with the conspiracy. In fact, he played the most important role. And that's how it was removed. And what happened afterwards, there was a huge outpouring of public support for my government. So it's something that has never happened in this country before. We had hundreds and thousands of people coming out in the streets protesting uh, the next day when my, when my government was removed. And what happened subsequently was that we had series of by-elections over the next six, seven months. And my party swept the by-elections. 75% of them were won by us. So what happened was that these people in power and the handlers who from behind the scenes who got scared that, you know, uh, I would get back into power because the elections are scheduled this year. So they then tried to... Uh, they plotted to have me assassinated. Now, this was no the assassination attempt. I had predicted it. I had, in fact, gone on media saying that they would use this idea of a lone gunman, some religious extremist, you know, who 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 had shot me. And they, but I had predicted it because they first started this campaign. They used this a fake video of 
apparently me sort of being uh, disrespectful to my religion. They used that to build up the campaign. And then I predicted that this is what they were going to use. Uh, a, a gunman who would a supposedly an extremist. But actually, it was again a, a campaign plan by the people, the, the, the three people I nominated. One was a senior member of our intelligence agency, the prime minister and the interior minister. Both the prime minister and interior minister have a track record of extrajudicial killing when they were in power before. Uh, there's an Amnesty International report about the current prime minister of having had people killed through police encounters. And there was a whole report. So, And then there was a massacre called the Model Town Massacre, where there were 14 people shot dead in day daylight, broad daylight, 60 people getting bullet injuries through police action. And again, these two people were involved. And so they were behind it. And I... And when they when the incident happened, I was very lucky that this young man, he actually uh, put his hand on the as he saw him take the gun out, he put his hand on it. And rather than hitting the bullets, hitting me on my top body, they ended up hitting me and the others on their legs. So I had three bullets in my legs. Uh, and then subsequently, the investigation found out there were three shooters. And unfortunately, that record, the, the because the people who were involved in the assassination attempt against me are still in power. So therefore, they have tried to sabotage the uh, investigation. But there were three shooters. And, uh, you know, my my two bullet wounds uh, on the upper part of my leg healed. But the one that hit me in the low part broke my bone. Mm. That bone is healing. And I, I hope to be... Um, uh, you know, recovered in a couple of weeks' time. And, of course, you having been an athlete, I, I imagine you, you know, you feel the loss uh, of of complete function even more. And, uh, you know, along those lines, uh, you've, you've had quite a busy week, sir, because uh, on Monday uh, you were appearing in court on the matter of bail for charges against you and you know uh, we, we should talk about those but uh from what i saw and heard uh for someone who has an injury to his leg among other things it, it looked as if you you know perhaps had to walk here and there and i read that they did denied the request for a, a zoom hearing instead and so on so uh, aside from the charges which we can talk about what why did it transpire exactly in that way do you think well the two charges i appeared in court for by the way there are 70 cases instituted against me right now so I've been appearing in courts before too, you know, one case after another. But these two cases which I appeared, I just need to tell the uh, your 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 viewers. One is there's a terrorist terrorism case against me, and that is uh, there was a demonstration outside the election commission when they disqualified me. I wasn't even in the demonstration, and for that they they instituted a, a, a terrorism case. So, which is, uh, you know, which obviously it's a joke. And secondly, there was another case which on a report, it's not even, the the report hasn't even got the input of, of my side or my, you know, my party side. On that report, they had an, a, 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 a warrants for my address on that, which the, the high court has thrown that away. So this was by the election commission. The high court considered a report. So it, the high court doesn't think of this as an authentic report because our side hasn't come through. And on that, they still had a, a, a case against me of uh, warrants for my arrest. So that's why I went to get bail. Uh, and the courts wanted a physical appearance. And my own worry was that, you know, my leg still hasn't fully healed and I after resting for three and a half months, the last thing I want to do is that just when the, it's about to heal, I didn't want to knock on the leg because I, I've got an election campaign ahead of me and a knock would, any chance of uh, a, a jerk or a knock would actually uh, 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 open up the wound again. So that's right. why I was being careful. 
And uh, well, you mentioned you have an election campaign ahead. Uh, my understanding is that uh, that uh, the election commission or whatever body it is has ruled that you personally cannot uh, run for office for five years. Is that correct? No, that's not correct. They, you see, the election commission, unfortunately, is a part of the ruling party. It's it's so blatantly biased. There are various decisions they've give, given against my party, and all of them have been set aside by the courts. So when it goes to court, they set it aside. And this too, they, they banned me, and then it was set aside by the court. It's so blatantly biased. So no, I, I can contest elections. Oh, okay. Well, uh, I hope we get to your plans before we're done, but uh, I'd like to, if I may, pivot a little bit because, uh, you know, here in the United States, uh, we get not nearly enough information about Pakistan and the people involved there, I would say, given that it's the world's fifth most populous country and, you know, of strategic importance and of course of moral importance as well um so i guess one of the questions that i think my audience would have about you personally sir is uh i'm sure most of them know that here is a man who was famous and wealthy and successful quite young as a as a cricket star as a you know and i i think before you entered politics i would suspect your image in this country was something of you know forgive me for putting it this way but a playboy kind of international celebrity and uh i think uh, you know with quite a nice life in london i suppose or somewhere in the uk and uh you know, I guess people might be wondering how it is that someone with what many people would consider a great life uh, of no, you know, no public responsibility, of comfort, of, you know, how one transitions from that to a situation of enormously hard work, which politics is, of risk, of, of you know, attacks. Uh, of various kinds, you know, is there a way we can help my audience understand how you transitioned from, you know, I know you're one individual, but from that person as we understood him to the person today? Well, Richard, look, um, from a sportsman who never thought that he would ever end up in politics, you know, last thing as a sportsman, I, I thought I would... Uh, I go to politics because politics never interested me. You know, the idea of going around and asking for votes. I mean, normal people are, are not like that. You know, they if you have everything you have in life, why would you want to go around begging for votes? And, uh, you know, and so the whole life, I mean, I was interested in politics as a subject, specifically international relations. But actually, the idea of being a politician never interested me. But, you know, what happens, I mean, in our lives, sometimes along the way, we ask ourselves the question that what is the purpose of uh, existence? That what happens to me once I die? So, you know, once you ask the, these questions, the only answer lies in the spiritual world mm. because science has no answer to these questions or the material world cannot answer these questions. So that's how... You know, from not being a, you know, particularly a religious person or a spiritual person is a better way of putting it. I ended up sort of on this completely a different path, which I imagined I would be taking in life. So from there onwards, uh, the more you go on the spiritual world, the more uh, your uh, direction in life changes. So from being, you know, a, a sportsman's life, a sportsman's worldview is very different because it's like, uh, you know, there, there are no second prizes. I mean, for, for, for losing a match, you don't have right. any prize. There's not much compassion in your life. Right. If you have too much compassion, you cannot have that cutthroat uh, competition, you know, when you compete at the international level. So from there, it, it went the other way where I where the spiritual life means that you have a responsibility to the society. 
So as being someone who was more privileged than anyone else in my country and who had more love and respect than anyone else. So then I started, uh, you know, first building the only cancer hospital in this country, a, a charity hospital because people can't afford cancer treatment. And then build a second hospital. Then also build a university, again, charity for underprivileged. And then I'm on, on my now second university. So, it, and then it went into politics. The reason why politics was because I wanted to have a welfare state, a state that takes care of its people. And secondly, rule of law. These were the two things that drove me into politics. Uh, because, you know, the first state built by a holy prophet, Muhammad, peace be upon him. He built the first state in Medina and that for all Muslims was the ideal state. What we consider the golden age of, our, uh, of, of the Muslim uh, uh, history. And he built that state on these two principles. It was the first ever welfare state in the history of mankind and it had rule of law. Everyone was equal before law. So that was my motivation, uh, ready for, for, for going into politics. And it, it, uh, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned uh, Islam, because I think that uh, also there's a conception of, of, as we all know, of Islam in the West that's been shaped by media, that's been shaped by conflict, that's been shaped by extremism and so on and uh you know the muslim history that i've read uh, suggests that uh, you know it was in fact uh, a social welfare state if you will and but that aspect and the spiritual you might say rather than the religious or structural uh, uh you know author uh, hardly authoritarian i mean as i understand it even in in the prophet's time there were shura there were councils there was uh, you know it was not by any means authoritarian uh if this is a model um how should people in in a country like mine view that uh, in other words in my country for example bernie sanders is very popular and i worked for bernie and um he was uh, very much an advocate of national community of a social welfare state of political democracy of so on um and while he's not overtly a member of any religion per se you know very spiritual in his own way you know a great admirer of spiritual leaders like pope francis when he speaks about uh, poverty and so on um so how should people like that view let's say a movement like yours look richard uh there are two worldviews one is the material you know what some of Capitalists say that, you know, it's greed that drives the world. And so because there's greed, you make more and more profits and eventually it trickles down to the people. You know, that's one worldview. The other is the spiritual worldview where you feel that the reason you're different to the animal world. Humans are different to animals for two reasons only. In human community, there is justice. In animal world, there is a might is right. In human community, there is compassion. In animal kingdom, there is survival of the fittest. So we differ to the animal world. And our religion, our book, the Holy Quran tells us that, you know, human was God's greatest creation. But it says that, you know, when a human is human, he rises above the angels. But when he falls, he goes below the level of animals. Because animals don't have greed. Humans have insatiable greed. So human can fall below the level of, of, of the animals. So therefore, um, if you simple way of explaining to people is that societies that have compassion, in my view, are spiritual. Societies that care about justice and justice. Why? Why justice? Because justice means the weak need to be protected from the strong. That's why you have rule of law. That's why the most civilized society, the more rule of law it has. 
So if, if you ask me what in the world today is nearer to the Muslim ideal, which countries, I would say the Scandinavian countries. I would actually say New Zealand. I would even say Switzerland. Because these, these countries basically have the most important thing for a civilized society, which is compassion and justice. Unfortunately, societies where you encourage greed, this is the problem with the world right now. The environmental problems in the world are simply because of naked greed, where humans never have enough. And unfortunately, uh, with the with the spiritual uh, spirituality diminishing in the world gradually, I'm saying over a few hundred years, the the spiritual the spiritual sense, the spiritual world has been restricted. Actually, the in a in a way it has been replaced by what I call the environmental movement or the green movement or the, you know, the climate change movement, it's people caring for other people. Whereas on, on the other side are these, uh, you know, people who never have enough naked greed. You know, this may be a bit parenthetical or perhaps not, but I've read some of the history of Islam and of uh, Muhammad and uh, the stories, the uh, Hadith, the stories about him. The first one I read when I opened a book was uh, randomly, which stunned me in a way was a story about uh, the prophet telling someone that when they when they wash themselves ritually in water not to waste the water even if it's in a running river which to me suggests I mean the river's fine either way but it suggests that an attitude of the human being towards nature is one of respect and non-wastefulness and it, it seems to me that's a bit of that's related to what you're saying perhaps is it well, planting a tree, I right. mean, according to the Holy Prophet, if you plant a tree, uh, you know, it, uh, uh, you will always, uh, what is the word now? I mean, you would be, the Almighty will bless you because everyone who benefits from the tree which you planted, even after you die, it will be counted as a, you know, you will be blessed because of that. So, I mean, it, the emphasis on environment, there's a verse in the Quran, which specifically says, Tread softly on this world. You know, tread softly on this world. So do not leave this big footprint on the world. Respect nature. Uh, so um, uh, the, his whole life was that of not extravagance. He, he lived a very, even when, uh, you know, he started from uh, very few followers. And then just before the end of his life, you know, he became the master of the whole of Arabia. And riches were flowing in from everywhere. But he never changed his lifestyle. He lived very austere, lived according to his needs. And any extra money would go to the poor people. So he set this example of, uh, of living as a decent human being on this earth. Uh, and unfortunately, you know, the always in, in, the, uh, in the history of mankind, there was always the struggle between those who tried to live for others and had compassion and those who, who lived the animal way of, uh, uh, of life. Well, thank you for that answer. And before I let you go, I know that one of the issues facing Pakistan now in the face of inflation and the terrible floods and so on, uh, there's negotiation over uh, an IMF loan. And my audience understands the IMF. IMF is a, a United States has a great influence with the IMF and the World Bank and these sorts of institutions. Uh, so I guess that leads me to ask, perhaps as a final question, um, what message would you want to have for uh, people in the United States and perhaps elsewhere in the Western world that dominates these sort of multilateral organizations? Uh, what would you like people to take away or think about when they think about Pakistan? Uh, firstly, you know, I'm just a word about IMF. It's when you mess up your economy, that's when a country needs IMF. So really, we, we have really mismanaged our country and not just recently. I mean, the last 10 months has been the worst. I mean, we really are on our knees right now. We've These uh, cabal of crooks, 
have bankrupted our country. I mean, we are, we've never experienced these economic conditions in our history. Uh, but over the last 30 years, 40 years, there has not been proper economic management. Uh, we have allowed our, you know, to live with, uh, beyond our means and never concentrated on how to create wealth in this country. And it's a very rich country. So therefore, we are responsible where we, uh, where we have to beg for loans, go to the IMF. But to the U.S., I think it's very important for the U.S. to understand uh, that, you know, humans crave dignity and respect. Mm. The relationships we want, uh, even though one country might be much stronger than the other, much more powerful, much richer, but human beings, relationships must have dignity and respect in them. And even when, uh, say, your U.S. in the past has been uh, good to our countries, I mean, it has given aid to them. And sure, you know, they expect things in return from the countries. But even when countries benefit from the United States, they still want to be treated with respect and dignity. Problem is when, uh, you know, when we, for instance, I'll just give you an example. We were, we joined the U.S. war on terror after 9-11. And Pakistan ended up losing 80,000 people. We had 80,000 casualties joining the U.S. war. But rather than sympathy coming our way, that look, here is a country which had no, we had no ter terrorist issues in our country. You know, our country had our issues, but we didn't have suicide attacks and bombs going on everywhere. We, it simply happened because we joined the U.S. war and all those opposing the U.S. treated us as collaborators. And they started atta attacking the state of Pakistan. So when Pakistan was going through this, uh, I would say, extreme suffering, the messages from the U.S. were very disturbing. They were saying that, look, we are paying you to fight. So there was no compassion that, you know, here's a country, you know, uh, I mean, 80,000 people, which ally of the U.S. Has, has given such sort of sacrifices for joining them in their war? I mean, look at the casualties NATO suffered. And here was a country which not only suffered these casualties, but the aid which we, we got from U.S. was some $20 billion. The country lost over $100 billion in this in madness that followed. So I think it was this uh, callousness that the saying that, you know, we are paying you to fight. Uh, I think that was what did not go down well in this country. Meanwhile, in the U.S., the narrative was was completely different. They said Pakistan is doing a double dealing and Pakistan is not uh, sincere in its help to the U.S., not realizing that even if Pakistan wanted to be, there was nothing it could do. There were 3 million Afghan refugees living in Pakistan. So how was Pakistan supposed to check any refugee because there's constant movement back and forth from Pakistan to Afghanistan? How could Pakistan say which one of them was going to be fighting for the Taliban and, and who was just going there for trade or livelihood? So in that process, Pakistan really got maligned badly in the U.S., Meanwhile, in this country, there was a feeling that, look, the, the, the U.S. is not at all grateful. In fact, it's, uh, it's treating us like a, a slave. And I think this is where the, the, the misunderstandings and the, the gulf between the two perceptions grew. Well, uh, uh, there will be hopefully many people listening to that and hearing that uh in conclusion i guess i i would just say that we thank you very much for taking this time we wish you the best and you know a good recovery uh and and, and all of those things uh, and once again thank you so much for coming on the program my pleasure richard thank you and we'll be right back after this this is the zero hour